Margaret Thatcher, 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 Margaret Thatcher. Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. That Britain's Conservative Party is deeply skeptical about the European Union isn't news. What is novel is the readiness of some of the party's grandest grandees to call for a British exit. One of them, Nigel Lawson, Lord Lawson, Margaret Thatcher's former Chancellor of the Exchequer, recently labelled the EU a bureaucratic monstrosity past its sell-by date. That intervention embarrassed Prime Minister David Cameron and deepened the impression of a Tory party dangerously divided. So why did he do it? Lord Lawson, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Seems to me that over the course of a long political career, you have made a quite extraordinary U-turn yourself from being a strong advocate of Britain's membership of the European Union to now becoming quite clear-cut in your wish to see Britain leave. The European Union has changed over that time. Uh, the European Union it was then called the European Com economic community at the beginning uh, had a very clear political objective it's always been political and the political objective was to make Europe safe from a third European and third world war uh, to be blunt it was to put the German tiger in a European cage so that there should be no recrudescence of German militarism which had done so much damage in the 20th century and that was a very sensible aspiration, whether it was necessary to do it, uh, to be safe. It was made a great deal of sense. I believe there is no longer this German militaristic threat. I think that's been, that's done and dusted. And as far as you're so concerned, that, that was the only purpose of that the European Union, was That was the major purpose. That was the major purpose. At the same time, Europe has changed with the coming of the common currency, the euro. Uh, of which the United Kingdom is not a part, and quite rightly not a part. And the Eurozone countries are having terrible economic difficulties at the present time. And the only way, and they know this and they say this, the only way they can move to solve these economic problems is if they accompany the monetary union with a full-blooded fiscal union, effectively a single finance ministry, a single uh, finance minister, a single tax system, a single benefit system, which means a political union, a full-blooded political union. The United States and of that, Europe. The United States of Europe. And that is not something which uh, Britain has ever wished to be part of. So you're saying that as far as you are concerned now, there is only one possible outcome for the European Union, and that is the full-blooded, full-scale federated United States of Europe. There is another possibility. They could abandon the single currency. But I don't believe they're going to do that. Anyhow, it is profoundly unsatisfactory for Britain at the present time, particularly because as the Eurozone consolidates, uh, there will be a Eurozone voting block, a solid block, which will have to be, which will determine things, and the British vote will, the British, British will be, always be outvoted. So, uh, David Cameron recognizes that it's unsatisfactory at the present time, which is why he has said, I am going to renegotiate the terms. I'm going to change, renegotiate a different kind of European Union. Yeah, a new relationship and between new re Britain and Brussels. Well, it is slightly unclear as to whether it's a new relationship between Britain and Brussels or a new relationship between the individual member states collectively or individually rather in Brussels. Well it seems as far as so he's concerned, is, whatever the others do, he's determined exactly, that Britain's right. standing that, with Europe precisely. will change. He, that is, that is, that is uh, what his declared objective is. And then he said, 
uh, th there's going to be a referendum on the basis of whatever he's exactly. been able to negotiate. And, and this, if I may and, say so, Lord Wilson, in or out. And, and this is where I need to start quizzing you quite closely, because you chose, at a very sensitive political moment, when David Cameron had just seen your party, his party, the Conservatives, do extraordinarily badly in a set of local elections, you chose to come out in public and say that Cameron's approach to Europe, this idea that, yes, I want a referendum, I will give you a referendum if I'm Prime Minister in 2017, but in the meantime I'm going to renegotiate and I promise you that that renegotiate will produce something much better for Britain, which I would like you then to vote on in a positive way, to stay inside the European Union. You dismissed that as absolutely incredible. You said that it was impossible to imagine a renegotiation being meaningful and delivering what Britain needs. You undermined your leader. I did not mind him. He can go and negotiate, and I wish him well. But my judgment, and my judgment is not based on, on prejudice. I mean, first of all, I remember, we've been through this once before. Well, with respect, it, it is highly prejudicial. You used no, the wording, you said any negotiation will be no, inconsequential. No, let me finish the sentence. Uh, this has been tried once before. Harold Wilson, uh, in, uh, when he came to power in 1974, said precisely the same, and he tried to do a renegotiation, and uh, he got absolutely next to nothing in return, and he then had this referendum in 1975, and he pretended that he'd achieved something, but he'd achieved nothing, uh, and uh, we voted, and I voted at that time to stay in, because mm -hmm. I thought on balance we should stay in, in 1975. I know the European Union pretty well, because all the time I was a minister, and I was a minister for whatever it was, uh, ten, best part of ten years, uh, and dealing with my counterparts, dealing with the Brussels bureaucracy, I know them very well, and I have many, many friends there, and they are not going to agree to any significant change. There is no way they're going to agree to any significant change, and even if one or two of them would like to, they've got to get the agreement of all of them, and that's not going to happen. So David Cameron so is, is plain uh, wrong, is he? So I, I think I, I, I would like to see him succeed, but I don't believe he's going to. So we're going to have to have a referendum. So therefore, in answer to your question, the reason I spoke out is I believe that this is such a momentous issue, an issue of such importance for the United Kingdom, that there needs to be a full debate, a proper debate, with all the issues thrashed out. And that is why I set out my feeling, why on the present basis, because I don't believe even though he would like to, I believe he's totally sincere, even though he would like to negotiate totally a totally new relationship, I don't think that's going to be possible, and therefore I think that we have to understand what all the issues are, and there are always arguments on both sides. I'm not saying it's all kind of dry, but I'm very clear where the balance of advantage lies, uh, that we should, we, we should uh, understand why uh, there is nothing to be afraid of in leaving. One of your former cabinet colleagues in the Conservative administration, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, said that your intervention was akin to throwing a hand grenade into a small building. Well, I think I, I like Malcolm, and he's, uh, you know, he was for a time a colleague of mine in government. Uh, but it is, it's, it's scarcely aggravating if we are told that we get to have a referendum. If we then say, well, let's debate the issues, let's discuss the issues. I mean, it's ludicrous to say the issues can't be discussed. But if I may and say, I discussed one of the most... Them in a, in, I discussed them in a very calm and careful, uh, not an extravagant, but in a logical and reasoned way. But, but the Tory party, your party, is, I think you would accept, deeply divided on this. There are some... Not many, it has to be said anymore, at the top of the party who are still broadly pro-Europe. Then there are sceptics, some of whom say renegotiation is the key to this, and Cameron would be one of those. And then some who say getting out is the, really the only solution to this. What you have done with your intervention is say to those who believe in renegotiation led by the Prime Minister that their position has no credibility, doesn't reflect the facts and shows no understanding of the way the European Union works. And that's a pretty grave charge to lay at the door of the Prime Minister. No, two things. First of all, I believe he's perfectly sincere, and I have not doubted this, or nor have I, nor have I stated... I uh, understood. You, you just think he's wrong. I think he is... I think he means to get a fundamental change in the relationship. I don't believe that is on. And therefore, 
uh, one has to say, well, where does that leave us and what should we do? When you say the Conservative Party is divided on this, or as you also say, uh, it is quite clear where the, I think the majority of the party now lies. But it's not just the Conservative Party is divided. The Labour Party is divided. One of their uh, most powerful donors has formed a group uh, for Labour to go for a referendum as well. And he's made it quite clear that he thinks that we should leave too. And the British public are divided. So this is not a party issue. The whole nation is divided on this. Yeah, the, 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 the problem, I suppose, is that in British politics right now, the, one of the most serious threats to the Conservative position is the rise of the UK Independence Party, whose position is quite clear. They say they are anti-EU. They want Britain to get out as soon as possible, which is pretty much your position too today. And the leader of the UK Independence Party, Nigel Farage, was the one man who truly warmly welcomed and celebrated your intervention because he said, look, if you feel like Nigel Lawson, one of the biggest beasts in the Tory party, that the European Union is bad for Britain, the only party that clearly expresses that view is mine, the UK Independence Party. Look, the UK Independence Party, which is uh, a very small party, even they did well... In the opinion in, polls, it's over 20% yeah, at the moment. Yeah, but it, it's not one of the major parties in the country. Uh, and the UK Independence Party gets, it. I think, most people agree, most of its uh, support on an anti-immigrant platform. This is not the issue we're talking about here. We're talking about Europe. Uh, and the... The fact of the matter is that I'm far from alone. After I made my démarche, uh, a number of other senior conservatives came out and said they basically agreed, including, for example, Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for Education, who indicated that he would uh, vote on the present evidence to leave the European Union. And he's one of the ablest members of David Cameron's cabinet and someone who David Cameron greatly values. So I think that we need to think not on, in terms of party politics. We need to think of what is in the interests of the United Kingdom. And that is what drives me. Well, let's just talk a little bit about that. Uh, there are a whole bunch of leading British businessmen who've written collective letters to the newspapers pointing out that the European Union and access to the single market where half of UK exports go is worth around 90 billion pounds a year to the UK economy and you know I can name them all from Richard Branson to Martin Sorrell to Wynne Bischoff and many others who say it is in economic terms fundamentally wrong and deeply mistaken to think that the British economy can do well outside of the European Union. Well, I know there are these fears, but uh, they are ludicrous and economically illiterate. I dealt with them at some uh, length in my article, but just to be brief uh, about it, because we haven't got all the No, time. we don't. I mean, I'm just uh, wrestling with the idea that all of these people who run some of the biggest companies there, in Britain there are, are economically could, illiterate. Yeah, well, they, you know, they are very good. People who run companies successfully, on the whole, what they're good at is running companies successfully. It doesn't mean they're experts on everything. And the, the, the fact of the matter is you only have to look at the United States exports to the European Union or to the United Kingdom, which is part of the European Union, uh, or Chinese exports to the European Union, including the United Kingdom. You don't have to be in the European Union to trade with the European Union. Sure, but none of those other countries have 50% of their exports going well, it's 40 to and we the European have more. Union. It's nearer to 40% and we should have more going this to Europe and Does more it? going to the growth areas. Well, the growth areas of the world today are not Europe. The growth area of the world today is the emerging world, the more successful countries in the emerging world, in Asia particularly, China and many other but Asian it, countries, yes, and that. also in Latin America. But that That is where we should be focusing our export attention. But does it give you pause when you hear the Americans, of Barack Obama, talking about the UK's membership of the European Union being, in his words, an expression of the UK's influence and role in the world? And when other unnamed US officials <laughs> tell the newspapers that if, if the UK thinks it can negotiate a trade deal with the United States just as the EU is doing right now, which David Cameron, of course, supports, they've got another thing coming. They say there's no appetite for signing I'll, a separate trade I'll, deal I'll with the American. You, I will tell you between ourselves what the American, uh, what the American attitude is all about. Uh, of course, we will be able to, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to negotiate a trade deal of some kind because it'll be well, in our mutual interest. You say that. Washington says something very different. No, I'll tell you why they say that. 
Do you know exactly why they say it, where the Americans are coming from? I uh, know them very well, I have nothing against them. America has always been concerned that the European Union will become anti-American. There is a strong a strand within Europe, particularly in France, where I live now, and I know France very well, uh, of uh, jealousy and anti-Americanism in France. And the Americans always believe that so long as the United Kingdom is in the European Union, that will prevent the European Union from turning anti-American. And that is why it is in the United States' interest for us to be there. That doesn't mean to say it's in our interest. You are now determined, are you, to keep pushing this idea that the Conservative Party must adopt a position which says, we leave Europe. No, I haven't dictated to the Conservative Party. And incidentally... Well, you've told them that's the direction Incidentally, no, I have said, I have said that my considered opinion is that we would, on, unless there is a transformation of the relationship between Britain and the United and the uh, U European Union, which I don't think is possible to negotiate, uh, we should leave, and therefore that is how I will be voting uh, when the referendum comes. And I th I've also pointed out that the problems for Britain, I think, are likely to get more and more acute as it evolves much closer to a federal political union in the United States of Europe. But that is my, and I have, but I'm, I'm not obsessed with this issue. As you may or may not know, I have interest in a number of other issues and I express my views on these as well. Well, indeed, and I do, before we end, I want to get your views on another set of issues which are very important where you are, again, close to the centre of the debate. You've been sitting on this uh, Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards and I just want to, before we end, to reflect on that with you. And it partly is tied to the European Union because you say one of the most dangerous elements of EU activity is the frenzy of regulatory activism that you see coming from Brussels, trying to, in your view, cut down to size the City of London and London's financial importance. Um, when it comes to learning the lessons of 2008 and the financial sort of meltdown, do you think there's ever any evidence that that the British government and the British system has truly learnt the lessons of what went wrong? Well, I hope so. I think some people have, and I think the Bank of England, uh, which now has the responsibility for supervising and regulating the banking sector of the city, I think that they have learnt a lot. Uh, and I hope that our commission, the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, uh, will be able to help move on. The position is that the position is there are only two major financial banking and financial centers in the world, and they are New York and London. We are the only one in the European time zone which is tremendously important. I want us to continue to be a major global financial center, and the main thing that is necessary to do that is to clean up the banking system in this country, uh, which is what the Commission, of which I'm a member, is about. And we'll be making various recommendations. There's no single silver bullet, so there will be a huge swathe of recommendations. Well, that, 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 Some I of agree. them quite radical. So but let me say, mm. there is another thing, too. The cleaning up is the most important thing. But also, we, can, we must not allow ourselves, and this is the connection between the two issues, which you rightly point out, we must also not uh, allow ourselves to be uh, governed by misconceived, misguided, uh, pettifogging European regulation, well, which would in fact damage London as a global centre. London is hang not on, European hang on a minute. Thing. May I just London stop you for a is second? a global centre placed in the European time zone. Yes, it is a global centre, but it has problems which have been obvious to see. The European Union has taken actions in the last few months which would put new and stringent controls on bankers pay, for example, limiting the size of any bonus to only 100% of, mm. of base salary. Now that's something which in London, pay and remuneration has been a huge issue, not least for the public who sees, bank, sees bankers pay as a, as a profound problem. The EU wants to act on it. Are you saying that's pettifogging, wrong and Well, I, I, I think that the remuneration is an important issue. You're absolutely right. But I do think that it's a classic example of where the European Union has got it wrong. Because the only effect of what they've done is to say, because is what they've said, you correctly characterize it, the bonuses uh, cannot be more than a certain proportion of the fixed salary. So what do you do? You put up the fixed salary. What good is that? 
you don't deal with the remuneration at all. In fact, you make the problem worse. I just wonder whether you actually believe David Cameron and George Osborne are interested in taking any of the advice of your commission. For example, correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be clear in your own mind that as a result of the terrible damage done to the Royal Bank of Scotland, which of course now 80% in public ownership, you think the only viable long-term solution is to break that bank up into two, have a, a sort of bad bank, a toxic bank, where all of the long-term debt sits and then free up a good bank to actually become a key player in the banking system for the future, fully privatized. You've said that's what you want. But it seems Cameron and Osborne absolutely don't want it. Well, we shall have to see what the Commission recommends. I've expressed my view uh, as a member of the Commission and somebody who has some experience of, of banking, both uh, as Chancellor and as being a uh, non-executive director of Barclays. Well, is, isn't it is incumbent but, upon but, the government to listen but, to your Commission? I'm sure they'll listen. Whether they will do what we recommend, we shall see. But all we can do is recommend what we think is the best thing. This is not, but incidentally, this, this good bank, bad bank split. This is not something that the Commission has sort of brilliantly thought up of its own. Uh, this is well known to any student of banking. Uh, it was what the Swedes did very successfully when they had their banking crisis uh, in the 1990s. And it, to some extent, it's what the United States has been doing successfully today because they had a, a banking disaster too. But to be clear about the future, you want RBS, just to, it's an important issue because it is 80% in public ownership and every taxpayer in the UK has a stake in this. You want it to be rebuilt in a way that the government at the moment isn't prepared to countenance. One of the problems with the economy at the present time, and I'm glad to say that there are increasing signs now that we are gradually taking a long time, but gradually emerging from the recession and the recovery is on the way. Not a breakneck pace, but it is, there are clear well, signs. Well, we could argue for a long time about the figures. There are clear signs, the most recent figures, are clear signs. But nevertheless, one of the things that's holding it back most is a lack of lending to small and medium-sized businesses who rely entirely on bank finance. One of the reasons why they find it difficult to get bank finance is because the banks still have huge amounts of bad debt on their books which they're not owning up to. And that makes them terrified of any new lending in case that too goes bad. If you had a separation between a good bank and a bad bank, then the good bank would be more in a stronger position to lend to small and medium-sized businesses and that would be excellent for the British economy and obviously very good for the taxpayer as well. Yeah, We've had incompetence, mismanagement, we've had manipulation of markets seen in the LIBOR scandal, we've had the chairman of your commission Andrew Tyree talking about not just a few bad apples but large numbers of people who over long periods of time conducted abuses, malpractice, what I would call fraud and it sticks in the craw that these serious offences haven't yet seen anybody emerge with a prison jumpsuit upon their bodies. What he seems to be saying is, for all of the talk here in London, actually, the government hasn't acted in a way the public needs it to act to change the mindset and the practices of the City of London. One of the reasons why the government, in fact, the main reason why the government set up uh, proposed and, and this commission and indeed the the Labour Party was opposed to the setting up of this commission they thought there should be a judicial inquiry so, with a high court judge in charge of it uh, everybody agrees something has to be done but anyhow I think that the government was right to say that, that this kind of commission would the parliamentary commission is a better way through but they set it out the government said because they realize that uh, there are a number of things went badly wrong and they want to see what recommendations we come forward with and you will hold their feet to the fire we will not be we will not be afraid to say what we think needs to be done and if they don't do it well then it'll be debated in the house of commons and the house of lords in short you think your recommendations can ensure that the meltdown we saw not least in the city of london in 2008 can never happen again I would never use the word never, but I would hope that they would, if, they are rec if these recommendations are accepted, it will be highly unlikely. And there's a further point, too, that, that what is, I think, very important to establish is that if there is another major bank failure, that the taxpayer doesn't have to step in to bail it out. Lord Lawson, we have to end there, but thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.